Fill your thirst beside the river Wash the journey from your hands Feel the comfort flow inside you Come this far, you understand Hi! Hello! Welcome to Healing Outside the Box. I'm Rosemary Lachance, a spiritual energy healer and teacher and therapist. Hi, and I'm Dina Scungio, a student and teacher of spirituality. We are dedicated, we are the co-hosts for this thought-provoking series and are dedicated to providing you with food for thought information and answers to all modalities of alternative healing, spiritual development, animal welfare, environmental concerns, and so much more in the form of guest speakers who are experts in their fields. This series is recorded and will be shown in your area on your local public service cable network. Please contact them for dates and times. And if you have a group that you think would be interested in what we have to offer, we're available to come to your group and teach. We will give you the contact information at the end of the show. Also, please visit Rosemary's website. Uh, click on rosemarylachance.com and click on my TV show, and you'll find a wealth of information about the show. The shows are also available on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and type in Healing Outside the Box, and you can make your choices of all the shows that are listed. Uh, we're constantly adding new shows, so keep checking back. We are also on Facebook under Healing Outside the Box. Uh, you can go there and like our page, and you'll get all the latest information about our shows. Uh, we hope you enjoy the show. Okay. Tonight is our show number 192, and the title of it is Caring for Survivors of Human Trafficking. And our guest tonight is Raymond Bouchard, author. Welcome, Raymond. Thank you. So good, good to see you again. Yes. You're welcome. Nice good to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. This is uh, our second time Raymond's on our show, and uh, he was on, we talked about human trafficking. We're going to go through that again, and I know this isn't like my usual show, but this to Ra Raymond is a work of the heart, a spiritual work of the heart, and that's why I had him on the show. I was so impressed with his dedication for this, so we're going to enlighten you about that. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Raymond Bouchard is an author, producer, and human rights advocate for over 25 years. He has worked to provide justice, cooperation, and equality to people across the globe. He often advises organizations in their mission to bring hope and encouragement to the world. Well known as an outspoken provocator, provocateur, provocateur. sorry. <laughs> um, Raymond is credited with writing multiple pieces of successful legislation focusing on human trafficking, forcing Facebook to enact stronger child safety measures, and removing thousands of illicit pages of content from their website, killing a Tribune media publication after it continued to run ads selling illegal escort services, and generally making people in power uncomfortable whenever he focuses his investigation on them. All right. <laughs> good for you, good for you, a fighter. Yeah, it's not so good for me, but yeah. I know, it anyway. it's not so good for you. I know that, I know, I know. When, when, you, when you stand up against these people, it, it's hard, but yeah. I'm just saying, I congratulate Thank you. you. I admire mm -hmm. you. I respect you. you for all that you do. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to ask you the question we always ask most people, what made you get started in human trafficking? Well, I'll try to give you the short version of it. Okay. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was working with uh, some very large uh, faith-based organizations around the country, and they did work all over the world uh, in helping people and in human rights work. I worked in communications. Uh, I developed their first websites and did video production and uh, all that sort of thing. And in traveling with them throughout the world, I kept seeing the this dynamic, this this thing happening. I didn't even know what to call it, human trafficking at the time, but I kept seeing it in its different forms uh, in our work around the world. Mm. And then in coming back to one of the organizations I worked with in New York City, 
we were doing a small documentary on a very wonderful foster care mother who had uh, the care of a little girl named Karen. It was five years old. It was HIV positive. Mm -hmm. His mother had been a crack addict, and uh, the city the, uh, care workers had uh, gotten kill Karen through a very strange series of events. And so we did this documentary, and unfortunately, uh, she was very ill, and little Karen really never saw her her seventh birthday. Aww. So I went to her funeral, and I saw this, the city worker there who was in charge of her case, the caseworker. And she said, you know, little Karen, she was actually one of the lucky ones, which was such an odd thing to say because really? a little yeah. child who had HIV who right. uh, didn't, didn't make it to seven years old. I said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, her mother tried to sell her two days after she was born for $200 on mm -hmm. the streets of New York. Uh, and oh this God. happens every, t uh, every day, but we happened to get word of it. And we were able to get the child and give her to the foster care mother, and she had she lived out and for her years a very happy life, and that to me was a catalyst. That was the turning point for me, because I I just I said how is this not the biggest news story in America? And she's telling mm -hmm. me that this happens every day in New York, that where they don't find out about it. Mm -hmm. And I thought if it's happening in New York, it's certainly happening everywhere else in every other large city. And so that started me down the road of understanding this thing we know as human trafficking. And oh gosh, that was, that was 15 years ago, probably more so than that. And th since then, not only has awareness around it built, but the crime itself has changed. It changes every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've, I've tried to attack it from several different um, aspects, from several different perspectives and from different uh, strategies to attack it every way we can. That's kind of how I started. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it, I t when I speak about this, and I s speak a lot about it in, in, uh, sometimes in churches or to community organizations or wherever I might speak about this, People say, "Well, your your work must be very rewarding." And it's like, uh, no, it's it's That's not really rewarding. As, <laughs> as we'll we'll talk about a little bit later, some of the people I've worked with uh, who aren't here with us, uh, it's you know you don't do it for the reward. No, mm, you, you no. really don't because it's just not rewarding. It just it takes a toll. So, uh, can so, you explain what actually happens to these these children and and these people who? Hmm. What what actual trafficking is for people who don't understand? Okay, that's a very good question. So, legally, um, Connecticut law, as far as defining human trafficking, what it is, and and what the uh, what constitutes committing this crime, now mirrors what federal law uh, states that it is. So that is that any uh, commercial sex act or forced labor in which there is force, fraud, or coercion involved in getting somebody to do something. So whether there's a third party have, making somebody do something for money uh, and force, fraud, or coercion is involved, or in, with a commercial sexual exploitation, if the victim is under 18 years of age, that force, fraud, or coercion, that legal test is no longer relevant. It's automatically human trafficking. So, okay. to be clear, when we talk about human trafficking, we're not talking about just sex trafficking. Sex trafficking is a part of human trafficking. So the other parts of human trafficking, trafficking are forced and exploited labor. And that okay. does happen here in Connecticut. Oh. It happens in our nail salons. It happens uh, really? sometimes in agriculture and domestic servitude, someone you know working as a domestic in a house. But around the world, the forced and exploited labor aspects of human trafficking is enormous. And that is the part, and I tell people, in which we are all complicit. Because we all buy those products in which slave labor has been used. Mm. Whether it's in the uh, mater raw materials in the batteries of our cell phone, or the coffee we're drinking, or the chocolate we're eating, or the shrimp we're eating. Uh. Yeah, it's there. It's, it's just such a long, long wow. chain uh, of events. So that's that part of human trafficking. But what many, many people focus on, much of the laws focus on, is the set, what we call commercial sexual exploitation. Mm. And that takes place both in younger people and minors, 
but uh, really the vast majority of victims in that category uh, are adults, are 18 and above. The difficulty there is that many, many of those services are directed towards minors, and that's understandable. But what it's done is it's almost created a, a situation where services for those 18 and above barely exist. Oh. I have tried to get services for victims 18 and above, 20 years old, in their 30s, and you cannot get help. And it's not as though they, you know, as we heard uh, in testimony before the Judiciary Committee here in Connecticut just a few weeks ago, from one of the victims who became uh, a lead witness in the Dennis Paris trial that happened here in Connecticut. That's what I wrote one of my books about that trial. She said, you can't just rescue a victim once from human trafficking. You have to rescue them every day. Because they don't have, it's not just the fact that they're in this situation. They have emotional and, and mental uh, issues uh, that they've okay, gone through. Yeah. It's not just this one time uh, thing that happened to them. Uh, imagine uh, a sexual assault that has taken place multiple times a day for weeks, months, years, wow. and what that creates. But there's also, because human trafficking does not happen without drug abuse and drug trafficking. So they've got addiction issues. They've got legal issues because they've been arrested. They've got financial issues. Yeah, Oftentimes they've got family issues because they have children that they've lost custody of. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just goes wow. on and on and on. And they've got just they've got to get to doctor's appointments. They've got to get the, to the court appearances. And everything and they've been on this they've been left on this sort of fringe of society so that they can't get, and they don't know how to get access to services that are due them. And it's almost a barrier. It creates a barrier once they are rescued and come out of the life that is impenetrable. And, I've, I've, and I have seen uh, just this year people I've known very well, victims who are out of the life, uh, lose their life because they have not been able to get the services that they uh, or do them. So is it because of the funding that for, to, to do it for them or is it, or the, they don't have the committee, they don't have the services or what? It, it's, it, you know, it, there's so much that have to, ha so the answer to your question is yes, part, part of it is funding. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex question, so it's a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. And it, it really, so to, to take somebody out of this life, first of all, they have to want to be out of it. They have to uh, be out of the, the addiction they probably have been exposed to and the drugs they've probably been exposed to. Mm -hmm. But there's also this addiction to the pimp, the trafficker, that is established, a person addiction. Oh, really? And that's very intentional. So in many of the victims I've spoken to, uh, they do not speak ill of the pimp, of their trafficker. They s continue to speak adoringly of them. And this is an intentional addiction so that uh, whoever that person is that's trafficking this victim establishes in her mind the thought that they cannot survive without him. The same way that yeah. someone is addicted to any substance or, or any behavior thinks they can't survive with, without that, right, yeah. without doing that thing or getting that thing. They truly believe they have to get back to that person. They begin to panic if they can't. So the minute they're out of jail wow. or out of the care or out of rehab, they go back. The recidivism in this uh, in this life is is incredibly high, and it's it's. I'm beginning to think it's almost impossible to get someone out and keep them and have them stay out, really? especially in the mentality of it. You know? Is it mostly women in that position? Well, as far as we know, because many of the victims uh, uh, present a f female, um, the, when you go to the, the male side of the victims, yes, there are. But there's so few statistics that are dependable or reliable. But because more victims, we're, we're finding more male victims now, uh, the, the, you know, whereas people used to say, oh, it's probably like 90% female, 10% male. Mm. That's probably not at all accurate. It's probably, I don't even want to guess, but it's, it's certainly uh, higher than that. Wow. 
But in that case, of course, you've got the clientele of, a, of the male victims are males who are often, uh, because of their family situation, whatever situation they're in, are hiding the fact that uh, they're leading this probably secret gay lifestyle. Um, and even though, you know, the society's uh, view of that is, is changing, they still may be in a position where they don't want it. You know, they may be married. Yeah. You know, remember many of the customers, the Johns, who create the demand for this marketplace, the vast majority there is male. Mm. And many of them are in relationships, are married, so that whether the uh, person they're buying to do whatever they want to do with is male or female, they certainly don't want their spouse or anyone knowing about this activity, that what they're doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this is the interesting aspect of this whole thing. The one very unreported part about this, yes, this is a hugely dangerous crime for the victim. And they get, um, you know, they can be punished by their pimp. Uh, they can be ad addicted and the, the scars are li last a lifetime. But what they often tell us is that the, how often the Johns, they call them the Johns, the customers, <laughs> how often they get beat up, how often they get uh, ripped off by the pimp really? or by the girl uh, or by the, you know, the, mm -hmm. they, but they don't, of course, they're not going to report not it to the police. Right, yeah. They're either at home or they're away on a business trip, wow. they're in a hotel, they're in their car, and suddenly somebody comes up and beats them up, takes all their stuff. Well, what do they have to call the police? What happened? Well, I was, you know. And sometimes they do that, but most of the time Definitely, they don't. Yeah. Well. They just have to show up at home and say, oh, uh, you know, honey, I got mugged. And, well, let's call the police. No, 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 no. You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to. I just mm -hmm. don't yeah. want to. Yeah. Right. So right. it's an extraordinarily dangerous crime to get involved in f for all three parties, for the pimp, the john, and the, gr and the, and the victim. Yeah. Are most of the victims brought in when they're underage? I mean, to, to <clears throat> get into that mindset of well, almost a brainwashing thing. You know, people will tell you, and I used to say it that the, you know they they had this they have this statement that the average age of someone entering into uh, commercial sexual exploitation is around thirteen or fourteen. Uh -huh. But no one can really prove that, and it's it's. I've talked to so many who have gotten into it and when they're in their late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, because by then their addiction has gotten a hold of them and now they need a way to support that habit. And now wow. that we're in the middle of an opiate crisis, an epidemic, um, where people are uh, moving from a prescription medication, they can't afford that anymore, so you know they, they buy very cheap heroin, mm. laced with fentanyl, and uh, you know we've got um, we've got overdose uh, deaths increasing tenfold over 10 years ago. Uh, we had more people in the United States die of opiate overdose last year than died in the entire Vietnam War. Wow. So in Pennsylvania alone last year, Whoa. in Pennsylvania alone last year, more people died of drug overdoses than we have lost military personnel in Afghanistan in the entire... Uh, Pennsylvania? Yeah, just in Pennsylvania. Wow. It's almost 5,000 people. So, I'm sorry, your question was about what age do they come in? It really ranges from uh, toddler, because many times, once it, 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 when you bring drugs into us, oh they are. Anybody will do anything to get that drug, including selling their own kid. So many, many times these uh, young people are, are pimped out, as they say, or sold by a family member, uh, an uncle, an aunt, a mother, a father, or step. Or Is it usually heroin care. that they get them hooked on? Well, when they're that addictive. young, when they're that young, you almost don't have to, but they do, because they're easier to control. And then once, because the trauma is so severe, once they're involved, that it's they almost need the drug to cope. Because of the stress and the and the and the abuse. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, that so helps. people think of of these traffickers, these pimps. They they think of a particular image in their in their mind. But we have to understand that uh, the young lady who came and, and testified, uh, Jennifer, who came and testified uh, to the Judiciary Committee to the legislation we have before the Connecticut uh, uh, legislative session going on right now. Uh, she was in, living in Vermont. 
She did have a drug addiction at the time, which her aunt knew about, who's here in Connecticut. Her aunt went up and got her, said, I know this guy who can, you know, life will be a lot easier in Connecticut, brought her down here, gave her to uh, this man in East Hartford. Uh, they got her uh, hooked on more drugs, and that man then sold her to a, another pimp who then started selling her for sex. And so it was just drugs and money, drugs and money. And uh, that was her life. So it was aunt, her aunt that brought her into it. And many, wow. many times that happens. Yeah, wow. it's, 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 so a pimp will have uh, multiple women in his stable. That's what they call it, a stable. And it's one, it's one of the jobs of those women to bring in and recruit other girls. So uh, the aunt got her. She then got other people. And it just spread out from there. Uh, uh, are, are, the, are the police uh, trying to infiltrate that as much as they are with their wars on drugs and all this other stuff going no. on? The simple answer to that is no. Now, understand the war on drugs is what well, it really started as an actual push uh, during the Nixon administration. So it's 45, 50 years old, the war on drugs. So every local, county, state, federal law enforcement investigator, prosecutor, trial judge knows what to recognize, uh, investigate, and prosecute, and try these crimes. They, there's a machine set up. I mean, they know exactly what to do. So if, uh, if someone is selling heroin, and they've got their stash in their car with them, and they get caught, they know it's, it's not going to go to trial. They just plead out. It's all formulated. You're gonna, you have this much of this drug. You're going to do this much time wow. in jail. <clears throat> it's one of the reasons we have over 2 million people in jail right now wow. in the United States. Wow. That does not exist with human trafficking. There's very little institutional knowledge in how to recognize it, uh, investigate it, prosecute it, try it. Very little. Now, here's another thing. And I do, I train law enforcement officers uh, here in Connecticut uh, because they're required now to get this uh, human trafficking awareness training. Oh. And one of the things that differentiates the drug trafficking investigation and prosecution from human trafficking investigation and prosecution is if, if I'm a detective uh, in a, a town here in Connecticut and I make a good drug bust, Get a good, you know, uh, the guy gets arrested, uh, gets prosecuted. There's this thing called asset forfeiture. So all of the stuff that, all the ill-gotten gains he's gotten from his drug business, the police department gets that stuff. And there's websites you can go on. It's called, you know, uh, policelockup.com or some of these policeauction.com. Really? <laughs> and you can buy watches and cars and boats and jewelry, everything that they were able to acquire wow. in this drug bust. They get it. So I'm this detective. Aye. I make a good drug bust, and my department gets maybe 50, 75,000 you know, wow. worth of stuff. In human trafficking crimes, all of that stuff goes to the victim. In Connecticut, it goes to the Victim Compensation Fund. So there's, wow. So if I've got all these cases on my desk, and they're all drug traffic, drug, drug crimes. And I know how to investigate them. I know what evidence to look for. And if I get a really good one in there, or a couple of good ones in there, my department that's probably you know underfunded right now gets money in. I know how to do that. And I've got this one over here that's human trafficking. Which which case is going to come up as my pri as right. my priority? I don't even know how to prosecute this one over here. Now here's the other thing. We've had, Connecticut has had human trafficking laws on its books since 2006. In that time, 28 federal cases have been prosecuted in Connecticut. Wow. Federal cases. There have been no state cases. There's one, there's actually, I should say, there's been one minor one. Wow. But in 11 years, we've had a human trafficking law in Connecticut. There's just been no prosecution of them. So why would I, as someone who's an investigator, a hardworking law enforcement officer, pick this case up and run with it when I know if I bring it to the state prosecutor, they're going to go, I don't want to be the first one to mess up a prosecu you know, a human trafficking case under this law no one's uh, tried yet. Is that because most of them go back and once they're released, they go back to what they're doing? Is that why they don't 
Well, so, I mean, so do the drug criminals. It's, it's really because it, uh, that institutional knowledge and experience isn't there yet. To go back to your original question, it's just not, it's just not there. They just don't know how to do it yet. And that's just a matter of time. Hold on. I know, it's frustrating, but believe in, me. It, it, in and of itself, it's a, it's a horrible yeah. event. I mean, so, that shouldn't be happening. So the recently, three men were arrested, uh, one of them very well known, who he owned Beamer Petroleum uh, in Glastonbury, and he owned Waterford Speed Bowl. Uh, not Waterford Speed, yeah, Waterford Speed Bowl. Waterford Speed, Speed yeah. I'd heard about that. And these that. three men were arrested because for years, for years, they had been arranging to have young men who had mental disabilities mm -hmm. brought to them and the they paper. were paying to have sex with them. Yeah. This had gone on for years and years and years. So that case uh, was initiated by Danbury police, but, it, uh, but, the, but they brought in federal authorities and of course now it's, it's, a federal, it's a federal case. And we haven't heard the last of that case. It's going to, I think it's going to involve a lot more people. Are they all in jail at least? Uh, they're in jail for now. I don't think that, I don't know if they bailed out, uh, if they were able yeah. to make bail or yeah. if they even yeah. gave bail. That was, but, I uh, remember hearing about that. Yeah, that was just the that end of March that happened. Yeah. So um, these typically, in almost every case, they become federal cases. So they do happen. And part of the reason that Connecticut has increased its its uh, laws against trafficking is so that we can initiate these cases on our own as as state cases. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, it just the 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 there's no lack of irony or injustice in this. Um, the, the gentleman's case I ran, uh, wrote about, Dennis Paris, that was a federal case that took place in Hartford in 2007, 10 years ago. Wow. And <clears throat> it was really the first case of its kind to take place in the country, the first trial of its kind. Uh, the, it was under a federal law that was passed in 2000, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And most of the people uh, prosecuted uh, under that, uh, that uh, law had been had just pled out they hadn't gone to trial but this one guy wanted to go to trial wow. he ran what he called an escort service advertised in hartford advocate at the time and uh but he was arrested and went to trial and is now serving a 30-year sentence in federal penitentiary a couple years after that his younger brother was also arrested for the very same crimes mm. uh, same motels on the sodestein highway and the berlin turnpike um, he was a little bit more violent than his brother, but the federal prosecutors didn't want to take that case. For whatever reason, they didn't want to try a member of the same family for the same crimes. They said, hey, Connecticut has a human trafficking. Let the, let the federal, let the Connecticut try it as one of their cases. Federal, the Connecticut prosecutors didn't want to take it, so they charged him simply with promoting prostitution as any other pimp would be. Um, he did a longer prison service time than most did. However, he had a partner who was his wife, who <laughs> ran, who recruited girls, took their pictures, uh, turned tricks herself, organized uh, sex parties for paying customers. She was also at the time a Connecticut state trooper. And she did no time at all. She got a three-year suspended sentence, got probation, and got no time at all. Why is it, is it because of the money that it takes to prosecute? I all have been of trying this? to find out why that case disappeared. Uh, uh, this is known as corrupt <laughs> mm. well, I don't know. You know, this is the reason I don't tell anybody where I live. Yeah, yeah. I don't I blame you. <laughs> I don't blame you at all because it's this is crazy. I think it is very crazy. Wow. Yeah. I this, had no idea. Mm. This goes on with people in government, I had no judges idea. and senators and people that, are, you know, the money, yeah. everybody does it. There well, has to, yeah. Yeah, there there has to be a lot of thing. money involved because yeah. if that's what draws these people. Well, not around. only that, they catch them doing these things and they don't get prosecuted. And so they're not they're not in a big hurry to get rid of that because then what, what would they do for their fun and games and stuff like that? Well, that's one of the things I say when I'm talking to a large group of people. And uh, I, I, I use for an example, wow. if I were talking about, you know, making people more aware of, of uh, a disease we're trying to cure, you know, no one in the room is going to be for that disease or pro that disease. Right. If I were talking about saving polar bears, mm -hmm. sure there might be somebody who might be, you know, deny climate change or not be an environmentalist or think that's a political issue, but they, they, they're not going to be advocates of killing more polar, polar bears. Right. With this issue, 
if I'm talking to a group, a large group of people, there's going to be in people in that audience who don't want this crime to be stopped, who right. don't, want, don't this want this market to be taken yeah, away. So you're because you, you, there are a lot of weird people out there with weird because oh, they all yes, do sexual there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. issues yeah. That, that yeah an enormous amount mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's it's ugh, I can't think about it because it's an amazing enormous amount I I do know that <laughs> yeah I know uh, so the, and that's one of the reasons I I, I wrote this book in particular. Uh, is because I wanted to take this case that happened in Hartford and show people that, well, if it happens in Connecticut, it can truly happen in everywhere. Uh, so while it's a Connecticut case, it really it, it illustrated very, very well how this crime happens all over America. And I thought for other people around the country, they certainly, they'll say, wow, you know, it's, it's, you know it can happen in Connecticut. Because the rest of the country thinks all of Connecticut is Greenwich. I mean, that's really, you know, they really think that that's what the whole state looks they like. They like and everyone like to think that. They, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I want to say, well, great. If, if we can get somebody in some other part of the country to say, well, how could it possibly happen where we are? Well, here, look, it happens in Connecticut. And it happened very, very severely in Connecticut and does every day. We've had some of the worst cases of human trafficking in Connecticut. Ten years ago, with this, with uh, with the Dennis Paris case, recently with these three men who were for years buying young men who were, had mental uh, disabilities, but in my research going back decades and even a hundred years, I found cases and reports and studies on this that described the crime, and the way they described it. In 1913, because I found a report that was commissioned by John D. Rockefeller. Wow. Mm. Yeah. And the way they describe it happening in New York City at that time is exactly the way it happens now. The way the pimps uh, behave towards the young women, the way they recruit them by pre pretending to love them, the way they use drugs and heroin in particular. None of this has changed. The only thing that's really changed is the Internet. Which has mm. made it explode, and that's the only thing that's really. It's really an changed. age old thing. It, it, it happened even when, uh, well, back in the in the, the days, Egyptians in the way. Oh yeah, mm, yeah, the old. This was perfect. all going on yeah. constantly, all the time. Well, yeah. This new carfentanil drug, which is the fentanyl and the heroin, yeah. they're calling it carfentanil, the... and they're warning us as caregivers to really don't touch it because the powder can be absorbed yes. into my skin, so uh, and I can be affected by it. Absolutely. There was a, uh, again, Pence, going back to Pennsylvania, there was a police officer, uh, they arrested somebody, he patted this guy down, he had the powder, the, 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 the perp, the criminal, had the powder on him. Mm -hmm. And the police officer, because he patted him down, inhaled a couple of particles, mm -hmm. particles. It took four hits of Narcan to revive this police yeah, officer. Yeah, we have to take mass we have to give massive amounts of Narcan and there are also issues with people going into um uh like a respiratory arrest failure failure yeah. distress that we can't get them out of you because this drug is so strong. It's so strong. So they're really I mean so the caregivers <laughs> are serious. afraid of it and we're, should be. Yeah. We're scared now because we have to worry about that the normal drugs we have aren't working and they're really dying now. We yeah. used to be able to save them. We used to give them Snarkan, break, wake them up, okay, we're good. But you're losing them now. Sometimes they, they take the drug thinking they're going to get high, and they don't think they're going to die. And we bring them back from the edge. You know, they're just about to die. The heartbeat's just about going. They're purple. We bring them back, and they, they're like, what happened? Well, you took too much of it. Now we're not able to save them so much anymore. Wow. She's talking from her experience because she's a paramedic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want the audience Sorry. to know that. Before we go any further, I want to now. introduce the, the first book. This is the first one that you wrote? No. Uh, no, no. It's, no. It's in there somewhere. One of the book. This is called The Berlin Turnpike. There you go. <laughs> All right. And it's an excellent book. Thick. But it has, it's it just, it'll tell you everything you want to know. You can pick this up on Amazon or whatever, wherever yep, they want to go. Or the BerlinTurnpike.com. Are all, yeah. are your other books on, on yes, Amazon? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you know, I've just had to revise that book again because that particular story just won't end. Wow. The people involved in that case, uh, you know, from the younger brother getting arrested to his uh, wife being a Connecticut State Trooper, I had to add That's that. That's awful. Yeah, and then some of the people and uh, witnesses in the case, and one of the people I was very close to uh, in the book that uh, plays a uh, sort of a starring role, uh, passed away this January from an overdose. Mm. And 
you know, so that, it, it just won't, the story does not end. There's no end to this. We wow. want to show the uh, audience uh, the, the two girls who, mm. and you can explain as they put their pictures up, they're going to put the pictures up in the control room and show them. And uh, he, Raymond, Raymond will explain about these poor young girls. I don't know which one they're going to bring up first. No, but. let's see. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, so this is Jennifer Kempton. And Jennifer Kempton uh, was uh, a, a long term uh, victim of human trafficking, uh, addicted to drugs. Um, she got into it when she was about 25 years old because of drugs. Uh, I, and she got out about four years ago and started an organization called Survivors Inc. I N K. Uh, you can't see any of her tattoos in this this uh, photograph, but oftentimes the pimps, the traffickers, will brand the girls in their stable with their name or something show. like that. And so her organization would work with victims to either remove these tattoos, because it's a constant reminder yeah. that you're literally branded like cattle oh. uh, would be. In, uh, do, do, with the the name or whatever his his marking were, so they would either change the tattoo or have it removed. They would work with tattoo parlors, all and artists all over the country, uh, either getting the money to get these tattoos removed or changed, or work with a tattoo artist uh, to change it into something else. Uh, I spoke to Jennifer uh, last not. What's today is um, what's today's, Thursday. today's Thursday. Thursday so I spoke to her last Monday, not this four days ago, but about ten days ago on a Monday, because uh, she and I she wanted to write a book about her experiences, and then we had talked at a conference uh, in Washington uh, in April, uh, and we, we spoke for a long time outside there about her experiences, and she showed me her arm and the scars, and she was telling me about her previous addiction, and it was just. Wow. It looked like it had been run over by something. So I spoke to her Monday because uh, she was helping another victim we're working with uh, f from the Dennis Paris case up in New Hampshire and talking about her book and to go about it. I woke up a week ago this morning. I woke up to an email that she had passed away of an overdose oh. a week ago last night. She was still addicted? Well, no, she hadn't used in a long time, but she, she, had, she was in a custody battle with one of her children, oh. and I guess she lost, for whatever reason, she decided to use, and uh, they, again, like, so what you're saying is very, very true. They, uh, someone found her, she was living with her grandmother at the time, uh, so a week ago last Wednesday, um, eight days ago, they found her unconscious in a hallway, they mm -hmm. brought her to the hospital, they were unable to revive her with Narcan and everything else, and she passed away a week ago today. That's Jennifer Kempton. Poor baby. Yeah, uh -huh. 35 years old, four children. Wow. And, w I mean, what a personality. I mean, she was just authentic and genuine and just, I mean, it was one of those people that when she speaks and when she talks, you just listen, to, you're on every word. She, she, she was an extraordinary person, personality, and she had such a deep devotion. And she's one of the people that was saying, listen, we cannot just, her whole thing was about after rescue, after the victim comes out, what we need to do, the services they need, and how we need to stay with them every day. And now she's unfortunately no longer a living example of, oh, of that sad. care that needs to was happen. Was she in any danger from her past pimps or whatever from, uh, you know, exposing all of this? Nobody so, would have done it to her, do you think? No, 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 I don't think so, because she, I mean, she's she's done a lot of public speaking. She was one of the keynote speakers at this very large conference in Washington. And, uh, okay. If you go to survivorsinc.org or Jennifer Kempton, she's ever, she was very so open about it. W w w did she feel like she was fighting an uphill battle she couldn't I, win? He doesn't know. know. Was there a change, know, a know. sudden change? Usually there's a sudden change or... Yeah. I, I wondered if. I mean, I. When my I was, first thought is someone else did it. Yeah, to of course. Her. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. but and that's uh, not hard to do. It doesn't do. seem so. It does. It does not do. seem so. We have one more. One more that we're yeah, going to put the picture up, and he's going to tell us about her. So here she is. Jennifer Kempton, who we just met, was born in 1982. So was Cattell, and this photo was taken of Cattell, who grew up in Newington, Connecticut. That's her first name, Cattell. Yeah. Pretty name. Very pretty name, and the way Look you see her there laughing. 
uh, is the way I'll always remember. I love this photograph she of her. She passed as well. And uh, she passed away of an overdose in January of this year. I gave her eulogy. Um, and again, the addiction just couldn't, couldn't, she, she couldn't, take couldn't, it. She couldn't, overdosed, couldn't take it. right? And this photo was taken of, uh, from by Larry Fink, a very famous photographer who uh, they did a story of which Cattell was a, a feature in Vanity Fair magazine so, several years ago. Uh, uh, so she got out of it? But she, she got out of it, but just because of the drugs, got back in, got back out, got Heroin back in. Heroin is a real tough one to beat. And uh, so Cattell was also born in 1982. So both Cattell and Jennifer Kempton, the woman you saw previously, uh, born in 82, died in 2017, both involved in human trafficking victims, both survivors of it, both died of an overdose. And that's just the people I know. Right. You know, and just the similarities of just two people I happen to know. Both, you, you know. know you're, you're so right. I mean, having done therapy with people and stuff, what you say is so right. You can't just leave in this case like this. They need so much therapy oh my to gosh. get free of everything. There's, you say it goes on and on and on because you're right. It's absolutely, you can't just cure yourself like that because no. something made you do it in the first place. And trying to get care for people. So with both Cattell, I spent years trying to get her care. Years trying to say, listen, this is what happened to this person. It's documented. Everyone knew it. Cattell testified. I'm talking about a couple of people who testified to get laws passed. Cattell did twice, both in 2012 and 2013, <clears throat> excuse me, to get rid of those escort ads that used to be in the New Haven Advocate yeah. and the Hartford Academy. Remember I those? I read those when I was a kid. Right. Yeah. Well, those ads went away because of the law we passed. Oh, and then huh. the whole magazine went away because it depended so much on those ads. Right. Um, I mean, she and people promised her help because she came and said, this is what happened to me. She had the courage to get up in front of everyone and say, this is what happened to me. Here's who I am. And here's what needs to happen to, so it doesn't happen to other people. And people said, oh, we're going to help you. This is great. Thank you. It never happened. It never came to pass. And she died because they broke their promises. So all these years later, we're trying to, you know, Cattell passed away in January. The legislative session starts, and we're starting to pass a law now that will require uh, drug, rehabilita drug rehabilitation services and other mental health services for victims of human trafficking and anyone arrested for prostitution in Connecticut. Great law. So at the state is the state This is the state level, yeah. So Jennifer, not an, another Jennifer who's still fine and had married and has kids in, in up in New Hampshire, uh, came down, who's a victim of Dennis Paris and testified before the Judiciary mm. Committee on March 27th with a photo of Cattell in front of her and said, listen, this young woman came and testified for my sake because I was one of the ones advertised in the Hartford Advocate. I never met this person, but she did this to me. I'll never be able to meet her, but now I want to I want to pay it for it. I want to pay it to pay her mm. for what she did for me. And she told her whole story. So that's the legislation we're waiting on now. And, wow. uh, and part of it is finally to say you have to give these victims these services. They have to be, be given uh, drug treatment and, and supportive services. Because even though she came down, this young woman came down two months ago and spoke in Hartford about all the things that happened to her in Hartford uh, at the hands of her pimp, and she said, listen, I never got, and I testified, she said I testified in a federal trial to put this guy away, this pimp, for 30 years. I never got the services I was promised. And to this day, she's never gotten the services she's promised. And did he get put away him. at least? He got put away. He's, he's doing so 30 years. So she's safe from him. She's safe from him. However, she's struggling financially with her, with her kids. Uh, they have housing insecurity, food insecurity. And so now I'm like, I'm trying to get services, legal services and all these other services for her. Now on the day she testified, here at the Hartford State Capitol on March 27th, P 
people hugged her and she said this was so empowering to me this is the first time ever anybody's ever hugged me because this happened to me and they said we're let's we'll help you all there were organizations that help victims or say they do there were uh, state agencies that say they help victims since she testified she has not heard from one of them neither have i and here she was telling people i'm in trouble now but i'm here to tell you what happens to us nothing happened in two months these people have had every chance in the world to help this woman and no one has you know we have about i know i've been sort 15 of minutes. no 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 <laughs> there's a couple of important things i i, I want to get out I, you know, we're going to finish that the two important questions so i'm going to Put them out there, and then you can go ahead with them. Okay. We wanted to know how much resistance you've encountered, and from whom. <laughs> yeah. And the second thing we want to know is kind of self-explanatory. We're telling people about that, but is there anything that people can do to help in any way with this, with what you're trying to do, with these girls, with you know anything like that? And yeah. The third thing is, I want to read that wonderful quote you have before we finish. Okay. I love it. Mm. So, so go resistance. ahead and answer. Yeah. Resistance comes from everywhere. Basically because people do not realize the extent of this crime and how much it happens. And you know, we hear all the same line over and over again. Oh, it's, it's, you think, uh, when, the, when, know, the media, when the media, when the, when the media reports on this, you always hear, well, if you think it doesn't happen here, guess again, because there was an arrest today. And then six months will go by. And another arrest will happen, and they'll repeat the same phrase over again. Mm -hmm. The very same newscaster will say, you think sex trafficking doesn't happen in Connecticut, it does. Then six months will go by again, and they'll say the same thing again. And they'll say, well, it happens right in your own backyard. Well, no, if I may, it yeah. happens right here. This is as far as you have to go to have a young woman or a young man or anybody you want. You can Just put in a... Google it. You, there are websites you can go to. Backpage.com is a big one that people are fighting right now. They arrested the CEO. Backpage is kind of like Craigslist. Oh. Uh, there's also all, this is as far as you have to go to order somebody and have them brought to you. So you don't have to drive around to that part of town anymore. You don't have to go to the combat zone or the red light district. You just have to go to your cell phone 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter how, if it's raining or it's cold or snowing or it's night or day. You have total anonymity, and that's all you have to go. I mean, so that's that's so. But when I bring this information even to law enforcement officers, when I do that training, uh, I did one uh, on Monday of this week uh, at, in New Haven, and a showing you know I did the, the presentation is very visual, a lot of slides about these websites and what's seen on them, and I had seasoned cops doing this, hiding their heads, turning away, because it's that disturbing. That's the one word I hear most in the response sheets that we get back, mm. very disturbing. And you can see them kind of getting mad about wanting to get, get going oh, on this. Oh, I've seen officers get mad on some calls right. that I've been, had to deal with yeah, that stuff. Which is great, because, yeah. you know, but they, so if there's a resistance is, is there, but not as much as there used to be. Because now people are understanding that, okay, this is an actual thing. This, this isn't just conceptual or just some do-gooder mm -hmm. saying, oh, you got to pay attention to this. This is happening a lot. The way, you know, you, uh, you, you do uh, uh, animal rights as well. I know you, you yeah. work a lot on that. And I, I do as well, a little bit quietly, but how much that happens oh, mm. and we don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Let's, well, that's a whole other. Right. We'll do another show on that one. <laughs> okay. So that's the resistance question. There is resistance from almost everybody. It, it comes from every. It, it's almost as though there's this force. We'll get into the spiritual aspect of it a little bit. That doesn't want this to end because the harder you push it against it into stopping this darkness, the more you push this light into this dark area the more something seems to come out of nowhere to try to douse that, that light. It's because they, the other side sees that light and is drawn to us. Uh-uh, oh, oh, can't have that. Exactly. Yeah. And there's yeah. where the spiritual comes in. You're right. Now, years ago, I would have said, oh, maybe, I don't know. But I'm yes, I'm in total agreement with you because I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. I've seen lights like these two young women who are bright, bright lights get extinguished for no good reason no good reason at all and they're gone at 35 years old both of them and well it you know, seems that's like the state's only demonic. recourse is to put these people in methadone programs and that's just another form of addiction 
Uh, uh, yeah, it, I mean, they're overwhelmed. Yeah. All states are at this point. Very they're overwhelmed. Right, it, this, this opiate epidemic has overwhelmed uh, state resources, federal. People don't know what to do, especially now with the fentanyl in it. They just don't know what to do. Now well, the they're caregivers. They're going to start dying. I hope that the, they realize that they're, they're going to start dying. The, 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 the chances of us saving you. You know, as a paramedic, are, are dramatically yeah. low now. So if you're doing this stuff, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, know. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, especially now that the caregivers and the cops are at risk just because they might breathe in a particle. Exactly. That's on and when they're telling us don't touch anybody with your gloves you on, make sure your sleeves are, don't you even let. You basically have to wear a spacesuit to treat somebody mm -hmm. just to be safe. And we're so. we're kind of backing off a little bit. Because I don't blame you. We're we're worried. I'm worried. Yeah. I don't want to. You know, this happened to me on a call, and I now you're down, now I'm down. Who's helping me? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's a scary thing to happen. They warned us right away about it, and you know, they just just like you said, a couple of particles get in your skin. And on your skin, you it don't have to breathe in. That's right. It can be just skin. absorbed, and you're dead. It's a world with low, low self-esteem. Mm. Well, it's that's the, the overall problem. With, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. We that's say what draws no, an adult who no, should know better back into it. Yeah, yeah, a world with no with spirituality is like going away it is and people they don't know what to believe and they don't know what to think they see how everything is happening in this world they see how politicians are people who are supposed to be leading our country and doing all these things they see how they fight amongst each other they see the crookedness they see everything and they don't care so, so they, they give take drugs yeah and they do the drugs to escape before and there's it was a lot little of money things, involved and now in there's more and more mm. and more the whole world needs therapy i mean that's what it's all about Hmm. I would say the best thing you can do is everybody help everyone as much as you can. I, I don't know. Do we need a spiritual revolution? Yeah, yeah, we really do. We really, really do because the other side is fighting like hell to, yeah. <laughs> to get us well to do put. these terrible things, you yeah. know? But, I mean, what else is there? For people to start on these drugs, there's something wrong up here. There's something going on. There's something they're missing. There's something they're lacking. Yeah. But they won't admit to what it is. No. They won't. No, it's well, in this country, it's not. I mean, no. this country is America, or the great America, and everything's supposed to be great. I don't know what's going on in other countries, <clears throat> but I think that the whole American dream thing is—it doesn't feel like it's within reach it's for so many anymore. people yeah. anymore. It's a broken promise. Yeah, and like I think it. people don't, you know, that there's not enough going on, and not enough culture. Not enough of a belief system to. There's not enough, just r genuine human connectivity. That too. You know? We were just talking <clears throat> about that. How when we were kids, when company came over, and even the comedian Sebastian Maniscalco was doing a whole skit on it. When people came over, when you were kids, you couldn't wait for people to come, and you know you had special food to put aside for yeah. the company. Mm -hmm. Now mind, they'd have somebody to call you rings say, the doorbell, you, you hide. Over, right. <laughs> we just come company, but yeah. they wouldn't come at supper. They would come after supper. They would do. They yeah. would sit with. You, we would play. They play cards. They would eat. They, it was today, no, nobody. Doorbell rings. People hide. Yeah, <laughs> come in, I don't want to see anybody. You know. Well, and for younger, it. for for younger people who've grown up uh, communicating in a, in a virtual world, that oh. that to them is their reality, mm. right? So, like w when we were growing up. Uh, you know, somebody broke up with us. They did it. You know, they might pass us a note, but we really didn't until they did it in person. You know, yeah. That's like so now. You know, I just, I just. This is going for an article. I was kind of an amusing article I just wrote that. You know, now when someone breaks up with you in person, like a younger people, someone in high school or something, they're like, yeah, yeah, right. But if they text it to you, then they believe it. <laughs> so their reality oh isn't real until they see it through an electronic form, because it's so much of their communication and connectivity at a very deep level is happening uh, virtually and, and through electronics. Wow. So, you know, but uh, something is lost without the the energy of, of, of us being in the same room together. Yeah. I mean, it's good and bad, right? Because now we can communicate with people and, and, and with uh, all over across the world and, the, and it'll, you know, Facebook will translate the language for us. And, you know, I have dialogues with people that I never would have met before, uh, and which is great. That part of it is good. That part of it is good. But with every technology, there's is, a is, yeah, there's a, there's huge a lot downside. of depression I've noticed, and I'll just say a lot of depression I've seen in my job, in in children who don't have parents who don't have coping skills don't teach their children, and they don't teach it in school. 
and, and they, they need yeah, to learn. Exactly. That's what they need to teach children, to it's, how to get through all of this stuff without turning to drugs, without or thinking turning that that's something. the best. Yeah, and right, you know, they, they the only that, way hey, out. Sometimes and uh, sometimes things go wrong. You know, let that you know you, you cannot protect kids from everything. Right. Sometimes, you, you, but it seems to be the norm these days. Yeah, that's exactly. the problem. Well, that's Let me read this to you because I want I want what to end battle. with saying what can we do to help. This is a quote that was on on your. Um, was it your email? My email. This is my yeah. signature quote. It's I not my this. quote. It's Dickens. Dickens, Please. right. So but it was on his. I love this and quote. And I love this so much. I'm going to read it really slowly to understand. And he says, I came here expecting an adventure and prepared to go through with any. If there ought to be that I can do, if there ought to be that I can do to help well, I don't get this. Okay. Did I say it wrong? <laughs> no, you say it for it's, me. It's, so it's Dickens, so it's yeah, written in okay. a, in yeah, a yeah. Yeah. I came here expecting an adventure and prepared to go through with any. If there ought be that I can do anything to help or aid you, name it. And on the faith of a man who can be secret and trusty, I will stand by you to the death. There you go. I love that quote. That is so mm. beautiful. It's basically what you know. It's it's biblical. You yeah. know, you know, what greater measure of friendship is there than someone to lay down their life? And that's what he's saying. Mm. That's right. Because, you know, I'm and here. Whatever you need done, it's basically that. You know, you got friends, but then there's that friend who will like you know uh, who will bury the body with you. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like whatever you need done, I'm here for you. Yeah. You know. I mean, you've been fighting this battle for so long, and. I'm sure there's other people like you have been fighting this battle. Mm -hmm. And these poor people, and like you said, the therapy that they need. What can, is there anything that people can do beside <sighs> being kind to one another and help? I don't know. What can we do to stop this? Well, what's what? next for you? I mean, where are you going Yeah, what's next it? for you with this? Uh, who knows? Well, what I want to <laughs> do next... <clears throat> So right now we're working on legislation in Connecticut. Now here there is some good news. So um, I went to some legislators this the beginning of this legislative session in January, and I said they said what, what should we do with human trafficking this year? You know we'd like to really address this issue. So I said okay. So I brought them this big document and said here's here's my wish list. Here's my dream list. And to my surprise. The language that came back and that was proposed had almost everything in it. Some really great legislation, awareness signs and businesses that that would uh, some of these massage parlors, these mm -hmm. not so reputable massage parlors that we have in Connecticut and all over the country. And there's a hundred and fifty of them in Connecticut. Wow! So they're going to have to put up signs. Uh, and so along with some other businesses, it increases the penalty against the uh, for the customers. It provides care for the victims, um, and it also starts to address the forced and exploited labor side of human trafficking. Some some good legislation. When it went before the um, House of Representatives last week in Connecticut, in this day and age of, of political strife, it was a unanimous vote positive. Everyone voted for it. Democrat, Republican, both sides of the aisle. There was not one vote against it. So now we're waiting for the Senate to vote on it. And then, of course, the governor's signature becomes law. So that's good news. So people can certainly call their state legislators in Connecticut and support. It's House Bill 7309. That's what that's what they need to, uh, to look at. It's a wonderful okay. piece of legislation. Right. Other than that, I know we're running out of time, but, you know, I know. So fast. What about legislation for, for kids, for high school kids, for... Before they yeah. even get sucked so into this So part of this world. legislation is that educators, every educator in the Connecticut, has to get the same kind of awareness training that I do with law enforcement officers. Yes. <laughs> and yes. healthcare professionals, every one of them, including you. Good. So I'll see you soon if the so law I passes. So hopefully, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, we should have you come and talk uh, with You'll our paramedics. Right. That'll be <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> It'll be All, right. So, All right. right. I hate to That's cut Raymond news. off. I really That's do. There's so much yeah, wonderful information. But <laughs> okay, we're going to give his contact information. To get in touch with Raymond Bouchard, it's Raymond at RaymondBouchard.com. That's easy. <laughs> yeah. And the, his phone number is 860-227-4029. Please support him. Please do what you can to help. He'll be there to help you to help him. And we do have specific victims you can help directly. It goes okay. right to them if this they want to. Great. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, and you know our contact information. Uh, go through it really quick. My phone number is 203-627-7966. Email me at whitebuffalo8comcast.net. My website, www.rosemarylechance.com. And from freewind one at comcast.net and on Facebook and Twitter under D. Scungio. Okay, so we've got a couple of minutes left here. Please we've learn. Got Please learn more about this and do what you can and teach your children. Please. Yeah, Please do what you can. And we, we've tried to enlighten you with this so wonderful thank feature. Thank you so much. Thank you so much right. for coming. Thanks for I'll come back you anytime. Come. Yes, we yeah, are. Yeah, we got we'll a lot to talk back. about. Yes, yeah, we do. Definitely. We'll <laughs> All have right. you back again. Good meeting you. you. Thank you so much. And thanks for the work you do. Be careful. Thank you. Everyone out there. Put your hearts into it. Good night. We love you. you Am I see? See you.